Welcome back to Niagawani with me, Nabila Khalida, and we're going to continue with the government plans to incorporate quantum technology into its structure with the aim of protecting Malaysia's digital security in the long run. However, Malaysian quantum technology is still in its infancy and could be fully matured within five years. So what does it take for us to embrace this new powerful technology? So to discuss further, we have the right authority joining me in the studio right now, which is Professor Dr. Lai Nai Shen, the Nanotechnologies and Associate Professor of uh, Technology and Innovation, Asia Pacific University, APU. All right, firstly, we could start with um, Prof. Could you tell us a little bit of your background and uh, what does uh, nanotechnologies do and how do you know more about quantum technology? Okay, I started off uh, as an electrical engineer mm -hmm. uh, back in University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. And what happened uh, along the way, uh, I did my final year project in quantum devices, mm -hmm. quantum simulation and so on. So that's the first time I'm exposed to uh, quantum computing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I find it very interesting because uh, at that time was about uh, more than 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, quantum is not very popular at the time. Mm -hmm. I think I'm one of the first few who uh, pioneer uh, okay. the way quantum devices are being created mm -hmm. uh, from scratch from a piece of silicon wafer all the way to a transistor level, uh, not many uh, people really understood the process. So uh, to put it in a simple uh, term, what is the difference between uh, what we are using today uh, as a classical computer versus a quantum computer? Mm -hmm. A classical computer encodes uh, information in a series of bits, while quantum computer uh, can encode information in parallel. So what does that mean? Uh, when you can encode information in parallel, you can actually process the information mm -hmm. very, very fast. So, uh, bringing back all this techno technology into Malaysia, uh, back in 2012, when I first uh, looked around, visited all the universities in Malaysia, uh, talked to some agencies, mm -hmm. uh, I realised that uh, quantum computing uh, in Malaysia is still not very popular at that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, fast forward to... When what was happened. that? Which uh, year? That was in 2012. 2012, okay. Yeah, so in 2012. So we fast forward uh, 12 years from 2012. Uh, what happened today? Uh, you can see uh, Malaysia start to uh, boost... Uh, boost... Start and boost. And start mm -hmm. and boost uh, the quantum initiatives in Malaysia, which is a good step. Yeah. So uh, what is uh, happening right now uh, from the digital ministry they have start to think about uh, yes uh, let's come up with some uh, policy uh, but that has yet been set up mm -hmm. so people are still uh, wondering uh, what is the right policy to be implemented uh, in Malaysia so that uh, everyone is actually protected from uh, quantum computing mm -hmm. uh, threat which which is going to happen uh, probably in about 10 to 20 years time uh, so to cut the story short uh, quantum computing is something that uh, everyone is trying to embrace at the moment, but they are also very worried about uh, when quantum computer is really being realized in this world, mm -hmm. uh, you may face uh, a lot of cyber security threat uh, and a lot of data losses along the way. Uh, so one thing that a lot of people don't realize today is uh, quantum computer uh, yeah. at the moment has not been realized yet. And it may take uh, easily about, uh, I would say, 10 to 20 years time to see uh, a very first quantum computer in this world. Mm -hmm. So what people do today, they refocus back to uh, what they call as quantum communication today. Mm -hmm. So quantum communication uh, can also mean quantum secure communication. Mm -hmm. So what everyone is doing today is they're trying to protect <coughs> all the encrypted data today mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that all this doesn't leak out. Mm -hmm. yeah. So all their personal data, their financial banking, uh, they are um, not just financial banking, it's also the government uh, data that they store mm -hmm. in their server mm -hmm. uh, to protect from, from all these threats. Uh, actually, all these errors has already been happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. A little bit of data each day are lost mm -hmm. or being uh, transferred to somewhere else which we don't realize um, what those people are doing today yes uh, there are a lot of uh, information being encrypted using RSA ECC 
those algorithms are actually quite well uh, encrypting mm -hmm. all the data that we have today. Mm -hmm. uh, if you didn't realize, they have already scrapping our data day by day, a little bit by little bit. So why they want this? They say, it's fine, I can get your data for the next 20 years. I will wait until the quantum computer being realized one day. And what I can do after that, mm -hmm. uh, I will just decrypt it using quantum computer for all the information that I've collected over the past 20 years. So this is something uh, very, very scary for a country. Uh, and what uh, Malaysia is doing right now, they try to protect uh, their data right now by going through quantum uh, communication or quantum secure communication techniques. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to uh, let Professor take a sip of water because I think you need that for your, <laughs> for your um, uh, throat. But uh, meanwhile, I can see that this is actually a good movement from the uh, government but also can be a double-edged sword in the context of Malaysia. I mean, we're a little bit fall, falling behind from other neighbouring countries like Singapore, Korea. But um, we would like to know, to understand better, uh, what could be the risk to Malaysia's national security and digital sovereignty when we apply uh, this quantum technology? Okay, uh, like I said previously, uh, all the threats have already been happening. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing uh, Malaysia can do about it right now. Uh, but they can implement uh, policies that actually in line with all the cyber security policies that we already have today. Um, what we are supposed to do uh, in this uh, national quantum strategy is uh, we should allow uh, quantum technology to be in Malaysia. So what am I trying to say is we try not to engage 100% outside of Malaysia and expecting uh, all the startup companies for quantum computing and things like that, uh, everyone outside to uh, tell us what to do or bring their technology uh, directly 100% into Malaysia and we just use it as a service. So uh, we try not to do that. We just allow the technology to actually be in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? We need to uh, allow uh, startup companies uh, from a homegrown Malaysian to start up a quantum computing company or quantum communication uh, startup companies and things like that. Um, this is something that uh, government should boost uh, by providing grants and providing more uh, fundings for all the ready startups, SMEs who are already in, mm. in this uh, mm. section or this, this kind of uh, uh, quantum study and all these things. Uh, so what happened right now is uh, Malaysia should, uh, government should allow uh, everyone to participate from around the world or from our neighbouring countries uh, to collaborate a little bit more uh, with all the universities and also uh, government agencies and also uh, I would say all the SMEs right now. Mm -hmm. And we actually already have a uh, few frameworks or uh, initiatives. We have National Service Security Strategy and we already have Digital Economy Blueprint right now. So how does this quantum technology actually help to fill the evident gaps uh, between uh, these two initiatives? And at the same time, um, how can actually government provide policies and also incentives to be introduced for, uh, fost to foster local quantum services and to actually ease the adoption and also integration since we're at the uh, project um, project, a pilot project, so it's still a pilot project. So how do we foster this uh, local quantum uh, technology in Malaysia? Okay, so uh, what, what happened uh, right now in most of the companies, they are dealing with uh, communication issues, right? data encryption issues, trying to protect uh, our data from even the current traf. Tra uh, we are not even talking about quantum yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so what everyone is worried is they want to uh, do, do something more than what they are doing right now by incorporating uh, quantum communication technology. So there are actually uh, two ways to do it. Uh, one of it is through, they call it PQC. PQC is actually, they call it the, the post-quantum cryptography. Mm -hmm. Post-quantum cryptography is actually something similar to how we encrypt our information today, but we use quantum technology to okay. encrypt. The second way uh, is to transfer the data around Malaysia or to another world, things like that. Uh, the transferring of data through something very simple for everyone to understand, through fiber optics, uh, is like transfer from one place, point A to point B. 
uh, that one is called QKD. QKD uh, is one of the way that you can transfer your information securely through fiber optics. Uh, QKD is called quantum key distribution. Okay. So this is, uh, these are the two ways. First, you encrypt your data securely, and then you also need to transfer your data mm -hmm. securely to another place. So what is lacking right now is we don't have uh, the infrastructure or sufficient fiber optic cables uh, around Malaysia to transfer from one place to another place or even from Malaysia to another country. Yeah, that can be a big challenge uh, in terms of the infrastructure, not just in Malaysia, actually in all our neighboring countries, we are also facing the same uh, infrastructure issues. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about uh, QKD, yes, uh, it's difficult to scale, very expensive and people are still looking ways to uh, cut down the cost, to improve ways to uh, transfer the information. Mm -hmm. While for the encryption, uh, you don't really need any resources, much resources to develop resources because it's based on calculations and some algorithms to develop it. So now what a lot of people are doing, they, they are focusing a lot on developing the algorithms just to protect their data because mm -hmm. that is the cheapest way uh, to start, we call it quantum. Mm -hmm. yeah. But considering all this cost and the high uh, complexity of uh, adopting or adoption of this uh, quantum technology in Malaysia, uh, do you think that we're able to catch up with the uh, neighbouring countries in the same region? And what happens if we fail to uh, adopt this in Malaysia? And uh, how can we actually, if we are able to adopt this, how can we actually sustain in the long run? Okay. So what happened in uh, Singapore? Japan, South Korea, they, they have already currently a government initiative being uh, put in place since 2020, not too long ago, about four, four years ago. Um, many of them uh, invested around, I think, uh, 100 million USD at least. Uh, to date, maybe uh, up to 300 million USD. So if we calculate and translate that into Malaysia ringgit, it's about a billion ringgit. Wow. Uh, not really a billion ringgit. I, I mean, depends. If it's 100 million, then it will be about half a million uh, ringgit. But if we, if we talk about uh, 300 mm -hmm. million, that will be about 1 billion ringgit. That's a huge amount of mm -hmm. money uh, the government is supposed to invest in quantum. Uh, so why they spend so much? It's not so much on this uh, quantum uh, communication part. Because quantum communication part or quantum secure communication is cheap. Okay. It's, it's not as expensive as acquiring a quantum computer. Mm, okay. So there's a lot of misconception. Quantum communication... So it's different, uh, two different things. There are two different things. Okay. Quantum computer and quantum communication, they are separate. But they eventually, they, they work together because quantum computer actually give threat to our data. And you need quantum secure communication to protect your data from quantum computer. Mm -hmm. So this is something very interesting for everyone to explore. So one way uh, Malaysia can quickly adopt uh, and not fall behind is not just uh, simply throwing money into these areas. Uh, we need to first create a very good ecosystem, quantum computing or quantum communication ecosystem in Malaysia. And how can Malaysia do that quickly is to First, either immediately engage with someone from overseas, some startups that's already very uh, well established, mm -hmm. to come to Malaysia to collaborate with some of the companies here to work on similar projects. So that's one way you can do it. Or Malaysia can also acquire mm -hmm. uh, certain ready-made products mm. and uh, put them into our curriculum in Malaysia, in universities, and train up the workforce to operate all these quantum computing. So we start early. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is one way. Uh, the other way is uh, we can also invest a lot like what we have done for our semiconductor industry in Malaysia 30 to 40 years ago. Uh, Malaysia start to have a foundry, a semiconductor foundry, and start to uh, create uh, components to build our PC today. Mm -hmm. So we can also do the same thing. Uh, I feel Malaysia is a good place to start a quantum foundry. So how quantum foundry can be set up? We can simply engage with 
-hmm. Already a quantum foundry in one of the European countries, uh, Finland. Uh, I can name out one of the company. IQM Quantum Computer is one of the company that uh, we can actually buy outright uh, the quantum computer and bring it to Malaysia. And what we can do is we simply just use it and learn from there and put it into our curriculum and build our workforce. All right, Prof. We, sorry, we don't have much time. Our session ends already. But thank you so much for ha helping me and also the audience understand more on quantum technology. But the question is, is Malaysia ready for the quantum sovereignty? So again, thank you, Professor Dr. Lai Naishian, the Nanotechnologies and Associate Professor uh, of Technology and Innovation, Asia Pacific University. And that's all for now.